you to our session on respiratory symptoms in foundation course on palliative medicine. Uh, it is my personal privilege and honor to welcome our faculty, Dr. Rajini Surinder Bhatt. Uh, she is a consultant physician pulmonologist at abodofdoctors.com. And uh, she has completed her residency in internal medicine and fellowship in pulmonary disease and critical care medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, New York. She is an elected member of the Governing Council Indian Association of Bronchology and uh, she is a mentor at uh, Death Over Dinner in India. Her areas of interest include interventional pulmonology, ILD, uh, medical humanities, palliative and end of life care, burnout prevention, death literacy, communication, communication sciences, healthcare activism and medical law and ethics. She is active in the fields of education with a special focus on uh, research and implementation of best practices in palliative pulmonology in India. So it is indeed our honor to have her with us as faculty for the respiratory symptoms. So ma'am, without much delay, over to you. Thank you so much, Sri Priya. Uh, I'm just, I'm trying out a new device. I'm in a different location. So please bear with me if I have some technical slowdowns and things. Um, a warm welcome to all of you. I'm so happy to meet all of you who have uh, enrolled for the foundation course in palliative medicine. This is a topic that's very close to my heart. And uh, Sri Priya, I'm happy to inform you that I just got the results of my national fellowship in palliative medicine. So now I'm palliative medicine certified in India too. So I'm happy to join the community of doctors who call themselves palliative medicine physicians. And I'm sure there's many of you who are listening in who after this course may be inspired to take on that journey of education and palliative medicine further. Um, Great news to start with, man. Great news to start with. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to just uh, try and share my screen. Uh, like I said, I'm on an unfamiliar device. So just bear with me while I try to get this going. Is this visible to all of you? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Okay, fine. All right. Great. So, uh, you know, palliative care and advanced respiratory systemic and systemic diseases is what I'll cover today or palliative care for respiratory conditions. Um, I, I became deeply interested in this field. Uh, I am a pulmonologist, so I've witnessed a lot of suffering that patients go through, but I'm a physician to begin with. And you realize that almost all end organ failures end up with patients having distressing respiratory symptoms. So whether you have end stage heart disease, you have end stage lung disease, you have advanced liver disease, you have advanced kidney disease, you have a neuromuscular disease, people will encounter some amount of breathlessness or distressing respiratory symptoms. So it's very important that we learn to alleviate that. You know, even the field of palliative medicine, uh, the the focus was primarily on pain and suffering due to cancer and many other conditions earlier. Uh, when I started getting interested in palliative pulmonology, which was about 10 years or more ago, you would find a textbook of palliative medicine, which would have 1,800 pages, out of which one section of about 15 to 20 pages would be devoted to respiratory issues. And now in the last 10 years or the last 20 years, I would say, in the last 10 to 20 years, there has been an explosion of research in the field of palliative pulmonology. And what we've managed to do with that is to alleviate the symptoms uh, of patients with respiratory disease much more. So what I'd like to do today is to briefly outline the scope of what we cover with palliative care in, you know, in respiratory disorders and systemic diseases. And some of these will be infectious communicable diseases as well, which have a chronic progressive course. So you know that some patients will have um, chronic diseases which are hard to clear like tuberculosis or which leave them with sequelae, which leave them with permanent lasting effects, which reduce the quality of life. Um, we look at um, you know, diseases like COPD, ILD, which cause structural damage to the lungs and then lead to breathlessness. And what is it, why is it that it's difficult for us to deliver good quality palliative care in these conditions? 
So I'm going to speak from the Indian context here. I know that we have listeners who are joining in from other from other areas as well, but I think for the global South, this is relevant. Uh, this was a paper which came out in 2016, and this was a Lancet survey of the burden of chronic respiratory disease. And if I put it in very simple terms, India is home to one sixth of the world's population, and we are home to one third of the global loss of health because of chronic respiratory disease, which means we carry double the burden of respiratory disease. This is true even for infectious diseases like tuberculosis. We have the largest population of patients with living with tuberculosis, and we have the largest number of patients who have multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, which is a serious concern. COPD is exceedingly common. It's the third leading cause of death in the world now. About five to 10 years ago, COPD was the fourth leading cause of death. Now it's the third leading cause of death in the world. The five-year survival in COPD is more than 70%. And you know, in cancer, we often talk of five-year survival being less. Here, five-year survival is more than 70%. Now, this means that the patient is living with disease and living with symptoms longer, which means we have to pay attention to quality of life and symptom control. Okay. Uh, the overall across the world, um, while tuberculosis is going down in the global south, uh, it is still a disease of significant concern. And for India, it's definitely a disease of significant concern. So how do patients fare in the care of these chronic diseases which cause so much of distress to them? Even in European countries, which have good quality national healthcare systems and have been practicing palliative medicine for a long time, when a survey was done, and this is 2015, and they compared people who are oxygen dependent. So you looked at patients who were on oxygen who were cancer patients, and they looked at patients who had COPD. And they found that COPD patients had a lot of symptoms. They had breathlessness, anxiety. They had pain and nausea, not to the same extent as cancer patients did. Okay, so... But it's not like it's not there. You look at the percentage here, 52% of COPD patients have some form of pain, which means half of the patients with a chronic respiratory disease also have pain. And we don't tend to treat it as aggressively. So the prescription of medications for pain in COPD is less. The prescription of medications for breathlessness, anxiety, and nausea is also less. So what ends up happening is that for some reason, even we as doctors, nurses, healthcare workers are okay with patients with chronic respiratory disease continuing to tolerate and suffer from their symptoms longer. So just because we don't have this fear of death hanging over our heads, right? It's not an immediate mortality, but it is morbidity. And all of you have learned about pain and many other symptoms now. So living with a distressing symptom for a long time really shifts the quality of life of patients. So we all know that when we don't treat well enough, it becomes chronic pain. The, the pathways in the brain of how we process chronic pain and how difficult it is to chronic pain, that's similar, even in patients with respiratory disease and even with breathlessness as a symptom. So we are giving suboptimal care in advanced pulmonary disease, right? Let's look at certain things like when we knew that this patient is going to die. We've learned about the principles of communication. We've learned about how important it is to address these situations when we know that uh, mortality is imminent or prognosis is not good. In many of our patients with COPD or ILD, they have a progressive decline. So we said five-year survival is 70%, but over the next several years, they will be declining. There will be more hospitalizations. There will be more distressing symptoms that they are experiencing. And death was expected in 80% of these COPD patients and 95% of cancer patients. But palliative medicine, home care was not offered to the COPD patients. Many of these discussions that we normally have with patients with cancer who we are, you know, have a bad prognosis, those conversations were not done for patients with COPD and ILD. So clearly, across the world, we are not giving the same attention to the distress of patients with um, chronic respiratory diseases. So what do we have to do? We have to look at what is the palliative care that we need to give in respiratory disease for respiratory symptoms. So these will be breathlessness, cough, related symptoms to the respiratory 
uh, related symptoms to the respiratory organ systems as such. And this could be cancer or non-cancer, right? So a patient with lung cancer could also have cough and breathlessness. A patient with COPD could also have cough and breathlessness. Patients with chronic respiratory disease can have non-respiratory symptoms. So I may be a person with COPD, but I have developed osteoporosis and I have severe pain. And I am elderly, so I'm coughing. And when I cough, I end up de developing some tiny little osteoporotic fractures and rib fractures. So I might be in severe pain. I might be having a dry mouth because I'm breathing so fast when I have ILD. There other end organ failures, as I discussed, whether it's heart disease, kidney disease, liver disease, they also end up having respiratory symptoms. And in the end, all end-of-life discussions do involve the respiratory system because one of the big life support systems that we offer to patients in intensive care units is ventilators. So we have to become comfortable with discussing how to address the respiratory symptom complex, which includes breathlessness, hypoxia, cough, excessive secretions, hemoptysis, very distressing symptom. And as it gets worse, it could be respiratory failure, acute or chronic Patients can develop pleural effusions. Patients can develop tumors which block their airway. So airway obstruction, which is mechanical obstruction, is another issue that comes up. And as I mentioned, many associated symptoms, which could be pain, nausea, constipation, anorexia, muscle wasting, sleep disturbance, dry mouth, anxiety, depression, loneliness, isolation, and guilt. You know, it's a sad situation that we know that tobacco is one of the leading causes of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. But it's very sad that when a patient is suffering, that's not the time to say, oh, if you had not smoked, then this would not be there, right? But very often this kind of ascribing blame language comes either from healthcare providers or from family members or community health workers. And here you have someone who's already suffering who probably is racked with guilt already. So any word, if every word that we use with them should have that approach of empathy and understanding that they already may be experiencing guilt, loneliness, isolation as well. Now, what ends up happening the majority of the time when they come to the hospital is that we end up looking at their test results. We look at their ABG, we look at their pulmonary function test, we look at their X-ray, we look at their saturation. And we do the best that we can but we may not be able, we may not be addressing their symptoms the way in the holistic manner that it needs to be addressed. So let's try and understand what really is breathlessness. And I'm going to ask all of you to do a very small exercise with me. It's going to take one or two minutes. Okay, so I want you to make sure you're sitting comfortably. Um, take a deep breath in and out, all the way out. Another deep breath in and out. The next time, take a deep breath in and hold. Hold your breath there. Keep holding your breath there. When I say it is okay to take your breath out, I only want you to bring down the breath one third, not all the way. Okay, so now it is okay to let your breath out one third. In all the way again, out one third. In all the way again, out one third only. In all the way again, out one third only. Keep doing that for five more breaths. And now you can let your breath out fully. Exhale all the way out and take normal breaths. Can one of you unmute yourself to uh, be able to share with me what that felt like? Or you can put it in the chat, uh, whichever you would choose. I would love to hear from one of you what that felt like for you. Can someone do that? Did that feel comfortable or did that feel very uncomfortable? Yes, Dr. Arnab. Sorry? Uh, yeah, ma'am, Arnab here. So uh, in the first two or three times, I mean, it felt okay. But I think after the third or fourth attempt, it felt as if the chest is getting heavy. And even taking breath in was a difficult process to do. It was becoming more and more uh, effort with effort and discomfort. Yeah. So the demonstration we just did is what happens with COPD emphysema with hyperinflation. So the chest is hyperinflated and you are breathing on top of a hyperinflated chest. So even taking in and out, everything is taking more effort. 
the same if you do it the opposite way breathe out almost all the way breathe in only one third breathe in and out at the bottom of as low as your lungs can go in capacity that is interstitial lung disease now this is how uncomfortable we felt with like what five ten breaths this is every breath for them for the rest of their life for one year two years three years four years five years as long as they live with disease this is them not sitting comfortably in a lecture, walking to the bathroom, trying to catch a bus. So imagine the degree of discomfort. So our connection with breathlessness is, you know, we don't recognize how distressing it can be. It's a very uncomfortable sensation. There's a feeling of air hunger. We're trying to get air and our effort is not rewarded. It's an unrewarded effort. Over time, what that does, anytime it gets really severe is that it, it brings on a threat for survival. It makes me feel I'm going to die. So when we look at pain, what's the worst pain I'm going to pass out? When I talk of the worst breathlessness, it's a threat to survival. I'm going to die. So think of the leap that's happening in your mind about the panic that creates. Right? There's many different aspects that affect our perception and sensation of breathlessness. So there's a cognitive, affective, how does our state of mind play on this experience of breathlessness. And as I mentioned, you know, now in the last few decades, there's been research, but we're still far behind the pain research. So if we want to understand um, breathlessness, you have, I'm sure, heard right by now, you started to, you know, work on the concept of total pain, where we look at physical, psychological, social, and spiritual aspects of pain. So you, um, you, you can look at dyspnea in the same way. There's actually a pathophysiology that's going on, which is your cardiovascular breathing, infection, weight, all of those things which are, are contributing to breathlessness. But there's also the context. Am I in my familiar surroundings? Am I where I know that, okay, I want to go to the bathroom, I'm breathless going to the bathroom. But if I'm in a, a, an unfamiliar place like a doctor's office, I don't know if I will make it to the bathroom. Will I be able to make it? I'm too breathless. What if... I, I lose control, things like that will happen. There's anxiety and fear as well, being in new places at that time. You know, um, for example, when you get very scared at that time, your breathing is affected. Mood also affects breathlessness a lot. So understanding that there are many things that play on the experience of breathlessness is what will help us to find the way to fix it as well. This is the one paper which revolutionized in my mind uh, my approach, it just, it opened my eyes and it is a landmark paper in the field of uh, breathlessness research as well. And this was in 2014. And here, this is from King's College London, Dame Cicely Saunders Institute. They looked at a cohort of patients who were on, uh, who, who had, you know, chronic refractory breathlessness, who were probably on oxygen support. So it was a mixed group. There were people with COPD, there were people with ILD, there were people with lung cancer. Some of them were assigned to a regular breathlessness support service. Uh, and the others was the control group, which got the best possible care for their disease in the usual manner. What they found at the end of it is that those who were enrolled in the breathlessness support service had less utilization of emergency services. So you have less acute hospitalizations. Um, they had a, a, an advanced care plan in place. And what they also saw was that there was a survival benefit. Now, normally, you know, in anything in medicine, we like to see survival benefit for any drug. And here we come up with the idea that a palliative care service, which looks at non-pharmacological as well as pharmacological methods of managing breathlessness is what actually helped in survival benefit for these patients. So what are these methods of non-pharmacological and pharmacological treatment for breathlessness? What do we have available? In non-pharmacological, what is very easily accessible to patients is using a handheld fan. So by stimulating the trigeminal nerve, this area of the face, with you to take a cool cloth, wipe it, and have a handheld fan, when there is an acute episode of breathlessness, it actually helps to decrease the sensation of breathlessness, allows the patient to calm down and be able to modulate their breathing better. We use breathing techniques. So being able to do prolonged exhalation rather than take in deep inhalation due to panic in a COPD patient. So we teach them to breathe in a rectangle. We say go 
So you kind of tell them to look for any rectangle in the room. You know, it could be the television, it could be a door frame, it could be a window frame. Tell them to keep doing this kind of a thing. You know, you fray, you 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 use your exhaled breath as a as as something which you use to mark the end, the longer end of the line of the rectangle. So you go. The inhalation will be automatic. Most people are trying to get breath in. What we want to do is encourage them to exhale. The automatic in-breath will happen. This allows them to um, have better uh, control of their breathlessness. Uh, for those who have hypoxia, the use of oxygen or non-invasive ventilatory devices like CPAP or BiPAP may be necessary. The other part of it is physical rehabilitation or pulmonary rehabilitation. It's a vicious cycle that happens that as you get breathless, you exercise less, you walk less, your muscle mass goes down, so you become weaker, so you feel more fatigued, so you walk less. But we have to encourage them to constantly keep making sure that they are walking and exercising because that's the only way that uh, they will learn how to gain mastery of breathlessness. So what we are trying to do is tell these people who have chronic respiratory disease that it's not it's not like they're going to take the breathlessness away, but we are going to teach you how to live better with breathlessness. Breathlessness will not control you. You will control the breathlessness. That's the idea. So mastery of breathlessness is what we're trying to do. So we now have you know, much greater understanding of breathlessness, of chronic breathlessness syndrome. What are all the issues associated with it? So just like there's anticipatory pain, for example, when someone has to do a dressing of a wound, or something, they, they start experiencing pain, we give morphine before we do wound care dressings. Uh, similarly, we, we don't give medication for anticipatory breathlessness, but we teach them techniques to recognize in their mind when they are starting to feel that sensation and how to use breathing techniques to calm that feeling down. Right. So for chronic breathlessness, we look at helping building patients' understanding of how does this breathlessness affect me? Is my breathing pattern the right thing? Pacing and positioning. What's the right position for me to sit in? Leaning forward on a table, resting against a wall. If I'm walking and I'm breathless, can I lean against a wall in a way to catch my breath? The use of the handheld pants, using distraction techniques when it's anxiety that's causing the breathlessness and always keeping up with pulmonary rehab, right? With the exercises, which is walking, which is doing sit-stand exercises. The simplest exercise I teach my patients to do and make them do regularly is to take a chair, sit up, sit, stand, sit, stand, to try and strengthen the leg muscles a little more because these are the things that are essential for simple things like going to the bathroom. You want to be able to have the ability to semi-squat. So if the strength in our muscles goes down, then that simple act of going to the bathroom brings on terrifying breathlessness. So we want to make sure that you're still able to do things. And this also helps preserve dignity, right? So a very important model which came about as a result of the research work of the Cambridge group is this breathing thinking functioning model. Uh, I will be sharing my slides. So, you know, please don't worry about that. You will all be able to look at this. And whenever you have a patient, you can look at what are the aspects you can use of this model, right? So I spoke about the inefficient breathing model. So teaching them to breathe correctly. The thinking is what happens when I experience breathlessness. When I experience breathlessness, I might go into panic. Now, if a patient has COPD, ILD, they are going to experience repeated exacerbations. At that time, we want them to recognize that they know they can control their thoughts and prevent that sensation from getting worse, right? So it's like the feeling of I'm going to die comes and then you say, no, no, this has happened to me before. What I need to do now is fan myself, ask my daughter to set up the nebulizer, ask her to bring it to me and then put a cool cloth on my face, continue doing the fan, take the nebulization, do my breathing in that technique that has been taught to me and I will be okay. This has happened to me before. I know the steps to take in order to get over this as well. So then that will prevent that vicious cycle from worsening. And the functioning part of it, as we spoke about the deconditioning. So they have to do the regular exercises. The other part with exercises is that as long as you're able to do that little bit of walking and socializing, there's a huge emotional psychological connect that one is able to maintain the family members, with colleagues, with, with the community around us, right? So that's very important for that as well. So 
these three aspects, the breathing techniques, the thinking, and uh, the functioning part of it, which, you know, every time you meet your patient, you can choose to focus on tech, helping them strengthen techniques in one of these areas, in these domains. And gradually they learn how to get mastery over their own breathlessness. So showing them what are the ways, the positions, when they are feeling more acutely ill and they have an exacerbation, then make sure they know the postures that will help them to breathe easier. I tell them to learn pacing. You know, you think of wanting to go to the bathroom. Um, sometimes they put it off until the very last minute, right? Oh, I'm going to get breathless when I walk to the bathroom. So let me wait until it's urgent. Then you try to go at one stretch, a distance of whether it's 15 feet or 10 feet, whatever it might be. You reach there, you're fully exhausted. Your oxygen level is low. Instead of that, decide to get up from your chair a little bit sooner before it is urgent and say, I will walk half the distance, pause for one minute, do my breathing exercise and then walk again. You might take two minutes longer, five minutes longer, but you will not be so breathless. So learning to pace and plan our activities will allow us to continue to retain control over our breathing and not feel in you know, acute distress at all times. So there's a difference between wheezing and strider and breathlessness, which family members should also be taught. Wheezing in this is the standard kind of sensation that people experience of chest tightness or whistling sound in the chest. Usually it's because of airway spasm for patients who have COPD and asthma or bronchiectasis even. Strider is when there is a blockage in one of the major airways. So then there is an inspiratory blockage. So when they breathe in, they are not able to breathe in. So the sound that comes is more like... <gasps> <gasps> and wheezing is like <sighs> like that right so strider is a more acute emergency so we we see that more in patients who have tumors um if there might be secretions which end up plugging the airway so we need to also help patients and their family members understand what needs to be done in that situation so if it's a patient with a tracheostomy for any reason and they you start hearing that kind of sound where they're struggling to take a breath in, then it might be a block in the tracheostomy tube. What you might have to do is actually take out the inner cannula, clean that out or do a suctioning. Whereas if the sound is wheezing, then they need a nebulization at that time. Over time, there has been a lot of advance in interventional pulmonology techniques. So if it is because of airway blockage, because of a tumor, Nowadays, airway stenting is done, tumor debulking is done endobronchially uh, through bronchoscopy. Uh, you know, it depends on the patient's financial status, insurance status, all of those things. Every country has different healthcare systems. These are slightly expensive treatments, but the fact of the matter is in terms of palliation of symptoms, if there is central airway obstruction, a tumor obstructing the airway, the patients who actually are the sickest do the best with relief of obstruction through mechanical means. So sometimes we think of it as, oh, this patient has an advanced malignancy issue. Do we really suggest this procedure for them? They will get good quality of life benefit if there is an obstruction which can be relieved. If the airway beyond the tumor is open, then even if the person has only three months to live, at least they will live that three months without experiencing the sensation of I'm going to die because my throat is going to close off, right? So it allows for us to do better end of life planning and get a better, more dignified quality of life, dignified quality of death even, where the patient is able to do it on their terms. The use of oxygen is very important for patients who have low oxygen levels. Patients with COPD, patients with ILD, need different kinds of oxygen delivery systems. And you will all be familiar with nasal cannulas and face masks. Um, there's also something called a high flow nasal cannula, which is used in hospitals only because it requires high flows of oxygen up to 50, 60 liters. Um, but we choose some of these specially for comfort. So some patients find the mask very claustrophobic. So in that situation, up to six liters, you can use the nasal cannula with humidified oxygen. So we try to look at what is more comfortable for the patient. Right? That's what the idea is. Same with the nebulizers, whether it's a nebulizer with a face mask or with a mouthpiece. Some patients with COPD, you'll find, you know, especially when they're in an acute attack, they're trying to pull the mask off because they feel claustrophobic at that time. So giving them a mouthpiece to do the nebulization with might be a simple fix where they will be more able to comply with the treatment that we are giving them at that time. 
with severe COPD and ILD, some of these patients will require oxygen at home. What is important is to understand that in these situations, we want to give oxygen if their baseline oxygen is low, right? Less than 90%, then they will, then their quality of life improves with oxygen. Or if they have drop in their oxygen saturation when they walk. These patients do well with domiciliary oxygen. Okay, so here again, um, you know, it needs usually a physician or a pulmonologist to sign off on the fact that they need oxygen. Now, some states have very uh, supportive laws and policies that support this. Like I learned recently that in Kerala, if someone is on oxygen or any kind of oxygen delivery device, then because their electricity consumption is more, um, if they get a letter from the government hospital or medical officers that they are using oxygen, then that amount of excess electricity consumption bill is subsidized for them. So these are the things that come up because it's such a big cost, you know, for using BiPAP machines and oxygen machines. Um, patients sometimes look at use of oxygen in a way that, oh, I don't want to go out in public with oxygen on. We have to look at it as something which allows them to be more mobile. So it matters how we communicate the use of oxygen to the patient. Patients will always look at the need for oxygen as a deterioration of their physical condition, which is a fact, right? I mean, in interstitial lung disease, it is a progressive disease. Uh, the prognosis is poor. They go down in three to five years, eight years. And when they get on oxygen, we know that at that time, that is the time when there's a lot of significant decline in their health-related quality of life. But resisting oxygen means that they will go into the isolation, muscle weakness, deconditioning cycle. So we tell them that the oxygen is good for you. Use it because it allows you to do all the things you like to do and lead an active life. Right. So that's the idea over there. Um, some patients will require tracheostomies if they are at risk for aspiration. Now, this is a very important decision to be made in connection, in, in, in conversation with the family. Uh, you know, some neuromuscular diseases like ALS, some patients who've had stroke, who have, uh, you know, uh, as, who are at aspiration risk, Parkinson's may choose that pathway of tracheostomy. Um, the loss of speech is a significant problem with tracheostomy. So again, these are complicated decisions. It needs sensitive conversation with the family and training them. Cough is a very distressing symptom. It's the, it's the second or third most common symptom for which people seek any health care. Again, something that we've started to understand the neurological pathway of more recently. It's a difficult to treat symptom. So it's important that we understand what is the etiology of the cough. Is it because of an airway disease like asthma, COPD? Is it because of bronchiectasis damage done because of previous tuberculosis? Is it because of an interstitial lung disease? Is it a wet cough? Is it a dry cough? Does this patient have acid reflux disease? Do they have a nasal sinus issue which is causing the cough? So what is the right therapy to do? So I like to, you know, I think we should all be practicing evidence-based medicine. So, you know, you'll see somebody who's, uh, suffering from cough and you see their prescription and they'll be they'll have a stack of prescriptions with some 10 cough syrups on it right most of these are not essential patients who have a very irritating cough which is causing you know irritation at the back of their throat to be, it's fine to give certain demulsants and lozenges you know but you could even use a home mix like honey or something like that, as long as they're not diabetic, and that's fine. What you need is something to soothe the throat at that time. Um, opioids are very useful for cough. For some types of cough, the, in, the inhaled corticosteroids that we use as inhalers in COPD and asthma are useful. So the guidelines say that there should be no routine use. We have to assess what is the cough due to and treat the reason accordingly. Nowadays, especially for ILD-related cough, we use more of speech therapy and gabapentin as well. That's been found to be useful. So opioids in low doses, especially codeine is what is used more frequently for cough. We give it up to you know, 15 milligrams or something at a time is fine to use for cough. Secretions is another distressing symptom because you know people produce copious secretions when they have bronchiectasis. It can be very distressing it's exhausting to bring out secretions. Sometimes there's bad smell and halitosis and it becomes socially embarrassing. So with secretions, 
like how we assess pain, we have to look at what is going on with the onset, what are the provoking and palliating uh, uh, factors, what is the severity, what is the volume of secretions, and understanding what the patient wants with this treatment of the cough and the secretions. Secretions can also be from above. They can be oral secretions. So you could have somebody who has a neurological problem who's having cooling secretions in the throat. This isn't coming from the chest. Or it could be bronchitis, tracheobronchitis, pneumonia, and that is causing respiratory secretions to come up. Right? So we want to only treat that which is distressing. Um, certain types of cancers, patients suffer from bronchorrhea, which is copious uh, liquidy secretions. So we will give something to, uh, we give medications like glycopyronium and things to decrease secretions only if it is an excessively uh, uh, distressing symptom. Here. If it is because of increased production of mucus, for example, with bronchiectasis, the patients have mucus stasis. There's a lot of production of mucus and it does not, it, it, it's hard to mobilize the mucus. So here we teach them how to do postural drainage, uh, chest physiotherapy to help clear the secretions. Right? So this is mechanical clearance of secretions that we are assisting. We're not trying to uh, dry up the secretions in this situation. Only in the end of life situation, do we use um, the anti muscarinic like the glycopyronium to help dry down the secretions only if it is causing more breathlessness to the patient, not if it is just audible disturbance, which is causing distress to caregivers, because there we just want to reassure them and say, as long as the patient is comfortable, no other treatment is necessary for that. Postural drainage is a very important part, especially for patients who have sequelae from tuberculosis. You know, So patients may go through treatment with tuberculosis and they end up left with severe lung damage after. So they're not having an infection right now, but they have copious secretions. So teaching them how to handle the secretions, how to do nebulization, postural drainage after that will allow them to have better quality of life through the day. And the cough doesn't bother them as much through the day. And these are certain devices that are available for specific diseases like bronchiectasis or for certain neuromuscular diseases where it's a neuromuscular weakness which does not allow the patient to cough out well. So this allows uh, a cappella device is what the, the, the device that you're seeing in green is called. The, the purple vest, we don't have that in India. Um, there is something called a cough assist device which you see uh, a patient being assisted with a mask that is in use in some ICUs to help us to bring out secretions uh, in some patients. These are the other devices that one can look at. One is the handheld fan and mobility aids. If someone is breathless, using a walker, they, don't, they may not have an orthopedic problem, but using a walker gives them something to support in that position where breathlessness is easier to manage. Plus, they don't have a fear of falling while walking. So that's one way of encouraging them to walk inside the house as well. Um, patients who are on BiPAP for long periods of time sometimes develop nasal bridge ulcers. Very painful. So we suggest using, if patients have to be on BiPAP for a long time, sometimes they have to be on it for months to towards the end, they might be on it for years, even last one year of their life. And we ask them to use this nasal bridge gel pack, which prevents ulceration and pain on the bridge of the nose. One more very distressing symptom that patients experience at times is hemoptysis. Coughing up blood. Can you imagine how scary that would be? You know, like you cough and then there's blood right there. And patients who have tuberculosis, fungal infections, invasive aspergillus, or patients with malignancies will sometimes have severe hemoptysis, where it's more than 100, 150 ml of blood coming out. Now, at this time, what we have to do is to do cough suppression. We want to suppress the cough. We don't want to encourage more, because we're trying to encourage a clot, a stable clot formation at the site where the bleeding may have occurred. We stop all nebulization. We give cough suppression with codeine or opioids. Other opioids, like you can give low-dose morphine, 2.5 milligrams. We give tranexamic acid, IV or oral. So that is what is given. And if the patient is very distressed by all of this, a mild anxiolytic can also help. Okay. Then after that, what other treatment can be done to alleviate depends on what the condition is. If this is something which is amenable to a bronchial artery embolization or a bronchoscopic intervention, then we may refer them for that after stabilizing them. However, if it is something where we know this is an advanced disease, an advanced lung cancer, and there is not much that can be done to salvage that situation at the time, we have to think of 
the distress that is causing the patient as well as the family members around. So can you imagine if you're in a hospital and you have white sheets and there's blood that's coming out and you can see how much blood you're losing. So using dark colored linens to reduce the visually distressing stimuli is another simple way of alleviating the distress that's caused by this. Give anxiolytics and opioids at that time to suppress that sensation that is there of breathlessness when you have hemoptysis and you feel like you might be drowning in your basic patients. Pleural effusions can be, again, a cause of severe respiratory distress. So as the fluid get, builds up in the lungs in malignant pleural effusions, uh, sometimes patients have recurrent pleural effusions. So they require chest drainage and we sometimes do pleural, pleurodesis, which is um, the injection of a substance which will cause the fusion of the parietal and visceral pleura together. Um, and talc pleurodesis is done, betadine pleurodesis is done. There are also newer techniques that are available, which is pleuroscopy and pleurex catheters, indwelling pleurex catheters. So again, it's important for us as palliative care doctors to know all the modalities available that depending on the patient's situation and what they are able to go in for or not, we should be able to give them something which is cost effective and can reduce symptoms to them. So we should be able to offer, whether it's a chest tube, pleurodesis, or a pleurex catheter. So those are the options that are available for pleural effusions. Of course, like in everything else in palliative care, you treat what is treatable. Right? So if it is because of CHF, if it is because of, um, uh, if it is because of an infectious cause, then we treat that underlying cause. If it is because of, um, uh, if it is because of uh, a renal failure where they've not been dialyzed adequately, then we have to refer them for that. But if it is because of something where it is going to be a recurrent pleural effusion, then either a pleurodesis or a pleurex catheter can become uh, something to them. Um, patients with neurological disorders will often have issues with swallowing as the disease advances, causing severe respiratory symptoms because of aspiration. So to prevent aspiration in some situations, a, a, a peg is advised. So, you know, sometimes it will be in combination with a tracheostomy and a peg, um, and sometimes it will be just the peg alone um, because we're not able to keep up with the nutrition. Uh, actually, you know, whether you have a peg or a rile stew, you might still aspirate, okay, because it's the loose lower esophageal sphincter through which there's some amount of reflux that happens and then they may aspirate. So all the precautions have to always be kept. The hydration should be adequate. Head and elevation, elevation should be there. You give textured feeds, modified texture feeds. But if you're noticing that the patient's weight is going down, malnutrition is setting in, then it's better that if this is going to be a longer process, the patient is going to live with this disease for a much longer time, then you make the decision to go in for assisted feeding with the peg sooner rather than later. Because if they're malnourished and they develop an aspiration pneumonia, it's much worse for them than if they are adequately uh, uh, you know, well nourished in that case. So there are certain um, things that we take care of where we make sure that, okay, you always make sure that the basic preventive things are in place, but then if it comes to it that you need a peg, it's better to make that decision sooner rather than later. Patients may have acute emergencies related to breathing. Uh, in any patient who has a chronic condition where we think they may encounter an acute life-threatening respiratory emergency, what is very important is to train family members, warn them of what may happen so that they have a plan in place. So if I have a patient who's on a tracheostomy, the family caregiver should be well-versed with how do you check for a blocked tracheostomy tube or change the inner cannula? How do you do a suction? Uh, what is the plan? Like, okay, as soon as they experience symptoms, I get the nebulizer going, I do a suction, I, you know, I, I check and see if there's anything that has come loose, right? So you do all of that and then you have a plan. Am I going to the hospital or is this something that we want to manage at home? So you should have a plan in place for all of these things at times. Um, Nutrition is something that's very important to pay attention to in respiratory disease. When patients with chronic respiratory disease like COPD or ILD start losing weight, then we know that's a poor prognosticator. So patients with respiratory illnesses should be on a high protein diet. It should be diet which is sensitive to the cultural, social, religious context of the patient. So it doesn't make sense for me to say, oh, you must eat eggs to someone who doesn't for whatever reason. 
but I have to find the right combination there, which is the locally acceptable food, which is high in nutrition quality as much as possible. Um, patients will experience GI symptoms. Um, so patients with COPD, because there is this breathing that they do, which is ineffective, end up swallowing a lot of air. There's aerophagia. So they end up developing bloating. Uh, patients with COPD may also have right heart failure. So they're on a fluid restricted diet. They'll end up developing constipation. They're not moving around as much that worsens the constipation. So it's important that we look at all of the associated symptoms, which we had spoken about earlier as the associated symptoms in respiratory disease as well. And we address that as well. Especially ILD patients will sometimes complain a lot of dry mouth because they tend to be, you know, huffing and puffing and breathing through their mouth. Most of the time, giving them something, you know, a lemony uh, thing to suck on helps in keeping the saliva flowing. Um, patients towards the end of life may complain of severe mouth dryness, can cause sore. So then sometimes we do use pilocarpine as well. Chronic pain in patients with COPD is not addressed at all in COPD guidelines. And, you know, we discussed earlier that as many as 52% of patients with COPD can have significant amounts of pain. So you have to treat it just the same way. You work your way up the WHO pain ladder and you use opioids as and when needed. The one part which we tend to not use as much of is non-pharmacological means very often for COPD patients and patients with breathlessness. It's a lot of musculoskeletal pain because they're using accessory muscles. Um, so non-pharmacological means such as TENS, IFT, all of that is very useful. And, you know, touch therapy, just having the family members massage them, ease that tension out of their shoulders regularly, get them moving. That's also a way of bonding connection as well as you know, relieving the pain that's possible. They tend to have sleep disturbances um, and we are wary of using over overuse of sedatives, but melatonin is something that one can use safely. Uh, so using that um, is important. Again, I like the, I, I, I think it's important to always incorporate non-pharmacological therapy as well, whether it's, you know, sound, progressive muscle relaxation, things like that. Um, briefly going to touch on tuberculosis. It's a controversial thing in, in, to speak about palliative care and tuberculosis, but we are home to one of the largest populations with MDR tuberculosis. And these patients suffer a lot of side effects due to their medication. So it is important that we address the medication-induced uh, symptoms in MDR TB because patients will develop peripheral neuropathy, patients develop depression, uh, skin discoloration, some of them lose their hearing, uh, partial hearing loss. So we must always address the symptoms that patients are experiencing as a result of the treatment. So MDR-TB is not dissimilar to cancer in that way that sometimes the treatment itself causes many symptoms to happen. So we should make sure that we're addressing their symptoms as well. Um, so I want to speak more about this as the health-related quality of life. So rather than treating the disease, we should be looking at are we able to give them the goals that they're looking for, which is to be able to gain mastery of their breathlessness. Their cough is controlled in a way that they're able to speak. You know, if they have a job that they want to hold where every time they speak, they're developing a cough, then sometimes speech therapy is what one needs to do for that. Teaching them simple tricks about how to, okay, I know I'm going to do my uh, postural drainage and I will be okay for the next one hour, then plan all your calls at that time. That's how we try to teach them how to work around their disease and still maintain a quality of life. Opioids have been avoided, unfortunately. However, they are a wonderful drug for breathlessness. They reduce the sensation of I am feeling like I cannot breathe, the urge to breathe. And regular low-dose sustained release morphine is good for patients with COPD. What we do is we usually, same as opioids in any other, in, in, um, in pain management, we start low and we go slow and we make sure that we give them um, any uh, the, med the, the medications to avoid constipation along with the opioids. You don't want to bring on a new symptom. Doses of morphine immediate release are as small as 2.5 milligrams every six hours is what you might start with. You might even start with every three hours and then go up to every six hours. For the most part, we don't require doses more than 30 milligrams over the whole day if it is purely for breathlessness. So five milligrams to four hours is probably the maximum that one needs to use and that's for severely for, for quite for severe symptoms so for most patients 
the low dose of 2.5 milligrams every three to four times in a day is adequate. If you have sustained release formulation after a few weeks when the patient has been okay on a certain dose, you could switch to a sustained release formulation for COPD. For patients with ILD, they do better with immediate release for episodic breathlessness. So we don't put them on maintenance sustained release morphine. We could give them episodic breathlessness relief with 2.5 of immediate release morphine. This is a simple table, which is a, a, an algorithm which is there in, uh, you know, we, this was developed by the Pali COVID Kerala Alliance during COVID-19 because so many patients were suffering from distressing symptoms. And we realized that there wasn't enough um, training in the use of opioids for breathlessness since breathlessness was a severe component of distress in COVID-19. This was the algorithm that was uh, suggested and recommended and I would suggest that you could reach out, you could download this and keep this uh, from the online resources in Pallium and that helps to, um, this, is, this is applicable to any situation of refractory breathlessness. When do we initiate end-of-life conversations in patients with severe respiratory disease? The most important thing is, you know, as clinicians, we have a certain uh, clinical judgment that we develop about prognostication. So if, if the surprise question is, would you be surprised if this patient would not survive for the next one year? Um, if you have seen enough patients, most of the time, this has got an 80, more than 80% accuracy, that if you think a patient may not survive more than one year, then that is likely to be true 80% of the time. That means it's time to initiate the conversation with the family about what they would want in the end of their life. What would be the place that they would want to be at? Death in a hospital versus death at home. Things that need to be done, getting affairs in order. All of that is important. The other thing, as I mentioned, is weight loss, right? Weight loss, the cachexia, these are things. And when you have more than one organ failure, when they start developing other comorbidities. So at that time, it's important to ask, what would you like to do? What would you want if the disease gets worse? And that allows them to express their plans to their family members to make sure the death is as per their wishes. Um, patients with respiratory disease, their caregivers go through a lot because they're constantly managing their nebulas, their oxygen, their hospital visits. Um, compassion, fatigue, and burnout is very high in caregivers. So always appreciate the efforts of the caregivers who bring the patients along and who are also going through sleepless nights along with our patients. So with that, I come to the end of the session. I hope it was useful for you. Um, you know, for our patients with breathlessness and intractable cough, getting through each day, being able to do something good, something positive with that day is usually the goal. So as I said, you know, you learn mastery of your breathlessness because it doesn't go away. And some days it's okay if the only thing you could do was nothing but just sit and get through the day. So we have good days and bad days. Um, as long as they know that we are there to support them, hold their hands, and then give them the confidence to say, it's okay, I'll try again tomorrow. You know? So that's the idea. And leave them with a mantra about how they can tune into something within their own voice, the thinking aspect of the breathing, thinking, functioning. And know that what we did earlier, you know, the same breathing exercise to be able to breathe slow, easy, to get the control back. Um, I, I advise... Uh, suggest to patients to have a photograph of a place which makes them think of peace and calm in their room. So that's something that they can center themselves on when they get an episode of breathlessness. And with that, we close today and I'm happy to take questions and I know we have a case presentation as well. I'm sorry if I ran a little over time. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that elaborate presentation. Um, I request everyone to please feel free to either unmute yourself or raise your hand or use the chat box for asking uh, your queries. Sylvia. Dr. Sylvia, meanwhile, I just request you to uh, kindly be ready with your presentations. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. All right, ma'am.
So ma'am, we have our first question for the evening. Is it safe to advise opioid patches to COPD patients in home care settings? Dr. Anish is asking. So, uh, is it safe to prescribe opioid patches to COPD patients? If your symptom that you are looking to address is pain um, and you have titrated the, uh, the dose appropriately, then with COPD patients, there should not be any fear of using opioids, right? If you have done, you know, when we prescribe patches, we have usually done first a titration with the oral opioid and then we are moving to a patch. Um, so the safety studies that have been done with low dose opioids have been done in, in severe COPD patients did not find any issues with low dose opioids. So when you do it in the start low and go slow, you can keep monitoring the patients. I would never start off directly at a very strong dose, right? So as I mentioned, the doses that we start with are slow are, are much lower for breathlessness relief. I'm assuming that you're looking at a patient who has severe pain in COPD and therefore you're looking at patches. Sometimes a good way of doing that is see if you can get them in uh, into the hospital for a day or two to be able to observe them and know that it's okay for them to continue on that dose and then you could convert to a patch. Again, in terms of when we look at what's needed for, uh, so OPS as such are not contraindicated in severe COPD patients. When I said about addressing pain, just because somebody has COPD does not mean that you do not give them opioids. The only places where you have that degree of being careful is when they are CO2 retainers, when they tend to have COPD with low oxygen as well as CO2 retention. There you may choose to observe them and then titrate the dose, but otherwise you can go ahead uh, with managing the pain the same as before, uh, the same as you always would in the WHO step back. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have a comment from Dr. Newstar. He's saying that he didn't realize uh, respiratory symptoms itself are so vast and under addressed. And at the same time, opioids, he, he always thought that opioids are a strict no-no in respiratory distress, which is, which is the general notion everywhere. It is the general belief, isn't it, doctor? Because if you think about it, now let's go back to what we were taught traditionally for management of heart failure. You know, we used to be, we used to be told that a patient comes with heart failure, you give Mona, morphine, oxygen, nitrates, aspirin, right? Morphine was the first drug in Mona because the patient's coming with that breathlessness. Now, morphine also, opioids actually have cardiovascular effects as well. What it does to the pulmonary vasculature, what it does to the pressures as well. So there is that beneficial effect that low dose opioids give us in all these emergencies of respiratory distress. The idea is to be using it wisely. Right. So you, if it's a matter of it's an acute reversible thing and this patient's not going to be having chronic breathlessness, you don't need the opioid at that time. But when you know this patient's going to keep having these episodes, um, and especially for those at the end of life, holding it back, I think, is really sad because we know that we have it within our power to give them relief of their symptoms. Um, Again, I'd like to address it in terms of safety of long use of opioids. It's been studied in lung cancer. It's been studied in COPD, not so much in ILD. We know we can safely use chronic opioids for breathlessness up to six months, eight months for lung cancer COPD patients, right? So use all your non-pharmacological needs. Optimize all the other comorbidities. But it, I, I, I feel very distressed when I hear of patients with ILD, COPD, lung cancer who receive opioids only on the last three days before they die. Because you know they have been severely breathless for at least three to six months before. For at least three to six months, we could have given them a better quality of life, right? If we just got comfortable with using low-dose opioids, 2.5 milligrams four times a day, all of you who will start doing pain management will be comfortable with using more. So I just need more physicians to get comfortable with using that low dose safely and more people will be not as breathless as before. Thank you, ma'am. There's a question from Dr. Rajini. She's asking, can non-opioid medications be better for pain in COPD? Um, so... In the WHO step ladder, you will not start directly with opioids, right? Depending on the severity of pain, you will do in a, in a stepwise manner. So yes, keep that cautionary thing. Again, let's not treat all COPD as blanket COPD. It's only in the CO2 retaining patients that we are worried about it. Okay, so severe COPD is different from mild COPD. I will see people who have 
you know, just the diagnosis is written as COPD, but they, they've never had a COPD exacerbation. They have three other diagnoses of diabetes, hypertension, and something. Because of COPD, they might be having a severe pain and they're not, they're not receiving the opioids for it. So it's always important to address the degree of severity of COPD. Are they a CO2 retainer? Start low, go slow in a stepwise manner after having used non-opioid medications first, yes. And we have a compliment for like you. Like a in COPD. Oh, there's a comment there. I see that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Arnab, uh, he's one of our very active participants. Are you saying yeah. that he did his PG dissertation on COPD, but never thought the whole picture of, through a palliative perspective? Well, this is what we are hoping to bring out more of. And I know that along with Pallium, we are doing, uh, we've now recently we launched a course for essentials of palliative medicine for pulmonologists. So we are really looking to take this, uh, you know, I would say it's an upskilling all of us in how to address our patients' symptoms better to more and more people. Uh, there was a question about Decadura Bolin in COPD. For patients who start having muscle wasting and weight loss, Decadura bolin is useful for severe COPD. So there we usually give it in doses of, it's usually the 40 milligrams, 30 to 40 milligrams, depending on the weight of the patient. It's given every three to four weeks for three doses. And then you take a break for six months. For specifically if the patient is female, you would not give it more than that in six months because there is this, uh, the uh, because of the hormonal effects that they may experience because of it being an, you know, um, an, an anabolic steroid there. But um, definitely for patients who with severe COPD who are experiencing muscle wasting, cachexia, the decadura bolin can be useful in improving the quality of life. Reducing that has to be given along with a high protein diet as well. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so I think uh, we have run out of comments and questions for now. Yeah, let's go to the case. So can we go to the case? Yeah, sure, ma'am. Yes. We are sharing the case in a Uh, good yeah. Good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Sylvia Moses, and um, uh, I didn't see the patient personally. I got the discharge summary from the hospital where my husband works. And next slide, please. A Sixty years old female patient, diagnosed of mucinous adenocarcinoma. Excuse me, next slide, please. Yeah. Mucinous adenocarcinoma, unknown primary with lung secondaries. Presenting complaints, shortness of breath at rest and cough. Next slide. History of illness, started with loss of appetite and loss of weight six months ago. Then she developed breathlessness. X-ray showed patchy opacities in both lungs. Breathlessness progressively worsened to the point she was breathlessness even at rest. She also had fever with chills, which she needed admission. Next slide, please. On examination, she was conscious, oriented, and cooperative. Pala was present, no cyanosis, no jaundice, no edema. Pulse rate was 108 per minute. A respiratory rate was 32 per minute, BP was 96 per 50, temperature was 99.6 Fahrenheit, no chest retractions, lungs bilateral crepitations was present, no V's. Next slide, please. Treatment and investigation. Hemoglobin was 13.9, total count was 17,900. Urine WBs is present, CT guided biopsy of left lung lesion, mucinous adenocarcinoma. Sputum AFB into two negative. CT lung also showed features of chronic pulmonary embolism. UTA was treated with antibiotics, also treated with oral anticoagulant. She did not require oxygen. Breathlessness improved mildly. 
she was able to go to toilet with one person assistance and had liquid food next slide please psychological aspects she was anxious about her diagnosis she feared death immediately due to sudden worsening she wanted to stay alive till her granddaughter's wedding patient and relatives were explained about the extent of the disease poor prognosis and limited benefits with advanced treatment next slide please medications anticoagulant uh, tablet paracetamol antibiotics for uti next slide please main concern breathlessness worsening immediately fear of immediate death next slide please summary mucinous adenocarcinoma unknown primary with lung secondaries with uti and pulmonary embolism next slide please discussion points should the patient and relatives be given counseling home based care of worsening breathlessness thank you thank you dr silvia for the concise presentation so we shall open the discussion points uh, for all so the first point is should the patient and relatives be given counseling if anyone would like to unmute yourself and share your thoughts it would be great Dr. Silvia, would you like to start off by sharing your thoughts on it? Yeah, we should give the give the patient and relatives counseling because uh, there's a fear of death. So we need to tell, uh, explain about the condition, what she has, and. Uh, Else. Yeah, definitely. So we have started getting some comments as well. Definitely, counseling is needed along with uh, the treatment of symptoms. We have to tell. We have to first understand uh, where the family stands as to what is their insight about the illness, uh, which the the which the the uh, patient is undergoing. What are the issues which the family is undergoing, and then we have to start handholding them from wherever they are. so dr arnab is saying i think the felt need for the patient was her breathlessness which was not addressed with the medications prescribed um, so i think if i can jump in over here and talk about the breathlessness from the medication point of view this is a very interesting case right because it's about uh, when we say lung primaries the way i am understanding it is likely what this patient has is lymphangiectic carcinomatosis where it's an infiltrative process in the lungs because we spoke about patchy opacities and an unknown primary this is not a lung primary it's an unknown primary and the patient has pulmonary embolism causing the breathlessness her breathlessness with apixaban will get a little better in terms of the pulmonary embolism but as the lymphangiectic carcinomatosis will increase that will cause more breathlessness over time so here that fear of breathlessness which was there is exactly what you know we spoke about earlier right you feel i'm going to die i'm going to get so breathless so it becomes important that we teach her the coping strategies the non pharmacological methods about using a fan about pacing activities about keeping up her nutrition and muscle strength very often even with patients with advanced cancer this part if she is not going to be getting any kind of medications which will preclude maintaining her nutrition or that she's not going to be vomiting throwing up any of those things little things that we advise on this about just keeping up with her activity will keep the breathlessness at bay or how do we just stay within symptoms being to the point of acute distress so you might be slightly breathless but you learn pacing you learn positions for breathlessness you learn how to keep your strength up you learn to organize your house in a way that you are still remaining engaged with your family then the fear comes down 
right? Over time, as lymphangiectic carcinomatosis will progress, she will develop low oxygen. At that time, a little oxygen support may help her as well. Over time, as things progress further, the breathlessness will increase further. And then you would need the opioids as well. So this patient, in terms of medications, the apixaban will help right now with treating the PE part of it. But if there's anything else to fix, if there's any element of heart failure, if there's element of bees, all of those things, we try to correct the correctable always, then do the non-pharmacological means for breathlessness, then look at opioids after that. Thank you, ma'am. Um, the next discussion point is, of course, somewhere we know that the breathlessness may worsen and uh, the family members as well as the patient may not be willing to be in a hospital setting at that point of time. The near and dear ones would always want to be together and the patient would want to be in a homely atmosphere. So what would be or how can we guide the patient for a home-based care in case where there is worsening of breathlessness? Before we move on to ma'am, if somebody would like to share their thoughts on this. Ma'am, I think, would you like to pitch in ma'am? So, you know, I actually see a very interesting point by Dr. Jyoti Sharma over here. It's an unknown primary, the immunohistochemistry and the markers, I think, are important because in today's day and age, uh, patients can be on oral agents as well, which can, you know, she spoke about her granddaughter's wedding. If that is within a reasonable time, sometimes one does get... Uh, one does get an extension of, you know, those few months that are important to go through personal milestones. Uh, from everything you described about the case, this is the patient who's not yet on oxygen, right? So uh, she still is going to be at a reasonable performance status. We saw that she's able to walk with assistance to the bathroom. We want to try and maintain her at that level for as much time as we can. Home-based care of breathlessness here will be... Um, making sure that the family is engaged in her teaching her the breathing techniques, making sure the family takes care of her nutrition, making sure the family keeps encouraging her to do the rehab exercises. So when they do that together, she will remain functional for as long as possible. So it will be breathlessness, which is under control for as long as possible. As it becomes more and more, when she starts becoming breathless, even at rest, uh, or if she's uh, having low oxygen when she walks, then we will look at oxygen delivery at home. When she becomes breathless, despite all of this, then we look at low-dose opioids. In this situation, you'll be looking at low-dose, which starts at 2.5 milligrams every six hours, can be increased to 2.5 every four hours. When we reach that stage, we can look at sustained release morphine as well. Um, and uh, that's what we would do. Now, the family should be aware of what to do in these situations. Like, this is what to anticipate. When this may happen in the future, when that time comes, I may give you morphine. So that way, even the patients and family members are aware that morphine is still there in the future for us. They don't think, they're anticipating it as not as, oh, when, you know, one of the opioid phobia things is as soon as we say morphine for patients with breathlessness, they think it's end of life immediately. No, patients actually continue for several more months with the, with, uh, with symptoms under control with morphine. Um, and, uh, okay, there's a question here, with which type of patients do you advocate NIV use at home? So NIV, we suggest for patients who have COPD, who have, uh, you know, uh, type 2 respiratory failure, chronic type 2 respiratory failure. And uh, for patients who have certain neuromuscular issues, right? So if you have uh, neuromuscular weakness uh, causing type 2 respiratory failure, then these patients are on NIV at home. Uh, some patients have tracheobronchomalacia. So when they have tracheomalacia, whenever they lie down, their trachea collapses. These patients are given NIV at home. 
Usually it's done after testing for a sleep study. Next question here was, if you're giving morphine for pain and breathlessness, how do you go about at home? If a patient needs morphine for pain and breathlessness, usually if the patient already has pain and also develops breathlessness, we give about 15% to 20% more of the morphine dose to address the breathlessness component as well. So start low, go slow, same thing. You have a patient whose pain is well controlled. They also have breathlessness. You can increase the dose of morphine that you are giving for pain by 15% to also help their breathlessness. And at home, you were speaking about, it depends on where you are. I know that for my patients, they come and once we have the dose titrated and settled, they come and receive the prescriptions and pick up the, the morphine from the hospital every 15 days or so. Uh, I think that's what is done even at Karunashray and Bangalore. Uh, and in some, uh, some of the patients who are enrolled as part of the home care visits, then the home care team goes and gives them the, uh, the medication at home every 15 days. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, we have faced situations where if, when you look at the patient, the, the vital parameters are all within normal range, but the patient keeps saying that they're feeling breathless. So yeah. when such situations happen, uh, how do we go about it? Uh, do we think about starting uh, a low dose of morphine for them? Or uh, do we do something else? Do we need to take an x-ray for such patients to see if the lung fields are, you know, are bad? Or how do we approach this situation? So if the patient's parameters are all normal, right? Uh, any patient who's coming in saying, I'm very breathlessness, I'm, I'm experiencing a lot of breathlessness, you know, typically you will do all the acute measurements that need to be done, your saturation, your respiratory rate, your vital signs, everything is stable, not even a tachycardia, but the patient is experiencing breathlessness. Sometimes this can be because of certain mimics of breathlessness. Okay, so typically pulmonologists will look for vocal cord dysfunction or something like that. Sometimes a PE can present with very vague symptoms, which is just a sinking sensation. So you might want to screen them for these things, uh, at least like an echo to see if there's any elevated right heart pressure. Everything is normal. Anxiety will cause this. So actually a low dose anxiolytic at that time can be very useful. Sometimes patients have normal parameters and it's a panic attack, which is causing acute breathlessness. At that time, we want paper bag breathing. Now, I've seen people do this erroneously as non-rebreather mask. Okay, I don't want an oxygen non-rebreather mask. In a patient who's having a panic attack, you actually want a paper bag because they're hyperventilating. They are blowing out too much carbon dioxide. You want them to breathe in and out of the same bag. So it's literally a large brown paper bag that they breathe in and out of. And that helps to reduce the breathlessness then they may just need, then you need to find out what triggered it. So it goes into asking what happened. Uh, if it is an issue of uh, the, 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 the psychological element of something triggering breathlessness, then we need to address that, the primary cause. So we first rule out what are the potentially dangerous uh, diagnosis and when once once you ruled out that there's nothing dangerous and the vital signs are all normal then you're going to be looking at whether it's a vocal cord dysfunction a panic attack which needs paper back breathing or something like that okay ma'am ma'am just uh, just a follow up on that in case everything is fine but still there is a subjective feeling of breathlessness yeah are we going to try an opioid on them we can again like i said Subjective feeling of breathlessness, the opioids will work at that. So uh, if you if there is no underlying anxiety issue as well, but they're just feeling breathlessness, um, it's rather rare, you know, that they have everything physiologically, pathophysiology-wise, everything is normal. They typically, and it, there usually is an underlying anxiety there. So the anxiolytic works well. If that is not working for you, then you give a low-dose opioid. And believe me, I've, I've seen patients respond to like, like I said, 2.5 to 5 milligrams, one dose at night. And that will help them get over it. And as long as they get a good night's sleep after that, then they're, they're probably over it in two, three days. You don't need more than that. Yes, ma'am. So this, this again highlights the importance of addressing and exploring and addressing the various dimensions, which is there 
Yes. In the principles of palliative care, which is not just physical, but psychosocial, emotional, spiritual as well. Yes. Ma'am, many a time, many a times in the field, uh, you know, in our field scenarios, we see that there are elderly patients with a background of COPD. Uh, they have some form of, um, you know, um, uh, 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 lung cancer, but they are not on any medication because they are not able to follow up. There is uh, family issues, so there is nobody to take them to the hospital and um, they may not have any recent investigations done as well. So many a times uh, we think that, you know, what should we start this person on? Should it be something as basic as uh, salbutamol and then we go step by step with corticosteroids and then move on to morphine or how yeah. to go about this? So how do we tackle such a situation where there are there is a multitude of, you know, illnesses which we don't have a clue of at what stage it is? So you're going to look at everything in terms of a clinical exam then. So you look at what their vitals are, what their respiratory rate looks like. The posture tells a lot, right? So um, are they comfortable? I, I, I usually, when I do home care visits, I will inspect where the bed is, how far is the bathroom, is there something, is there support for them to walk? I literally fix everything around their room and their house for them. If you examine them and you find that there's a mixture of wheezing as well as some crackles that are coming through, it could be that the patient has an element of airway obstruction. When that is the case, I will put them on nebulizations with a salbutamol or a levosalbutamol. Um, if they are known to be a smoker, then you might want to give them the combination with the llama as well, with the anti-muscarinic agent as well. So you would use um, a ipratropium as well as a levosalbutamol or a salbutamol. Uh, put them on a regular nebulization because it will help to open up that little bit of airway obstruction and help them clear situations. Maintaining hydration is adequate, uh, is important to be able to clear situations. If you know which side the lesion is on, if I know it's a right-sided tumor, left-sided tumor, I can teach them the postures which will help them to then clear those secretions out better. So if you have, you know, a post-obstructive pneumonia, like things, say there's a right uh, a right-sided tumor which is causing partial obstruction of my right main bronchus, and I know that everything is right-sided, I will teach the family to nebulize the patient, make them lie on the left side, do gentle chest thumping to help them loosen up the secretions, teach them how to do a half cup, how to hold a pillow to their chest and go, <coughs> help them bring the secretions out. That will reduce their symptoms over time with that, right? And here you might want to use a mucolytic agent. I mentioned earlier that a lot of prescriptions are unnecessary, but sometimes a mucolytic helps to loosen up the secretion. So there, that's okay. It's not even an expensive drug there. Um, if you're suspecting or if there's a worry about hemoptysis and we're doing home-based care, Whenever there's blood that's coming out, you make them lie on the affected side. So if I have a right-sided lung mass, this is a patient with a right-sided lung cancer. If there's blood in the sputum, they lie with the right side down so that the good lung remains clean of any blood. The right, the, the, the bleeding side goes down, right? You do that. And then the dark linens, all of that. So as much as possible, we try to do this with the clinical exam scenario. Is there obstruction? Is there wheezing? Then you add on the nebulization. Is there secretions? Then you make sure hydration status is okay. You do postural drainage and chest physiotherapy. You may throw in a mucolytic agent over there. And if there is bleeding, then you give them the advance um, instruction that if there is blood coming out, then you stop the nebulization. You only give the morphine or the codeine and you put the bleeding side down. And you give them, you give them pause, uh, sorry, tranexamic acid uh, or tamsalate tablets to keep at home then. Steroids you mentioned, oral steroids are useful. Um, parenteral steroids are useful when they are in the midst of a COPD exacerbation, asthma exacerbation. So sometimes uh, when you walk in and you see the patient is, you know, it's like they're almost not moving their chest. It's almost silent. It's so quiet because they're actually so, so, so tight. So that time I would give a five-day course of steroids and a milligram per kilogram of, you know, methyl prednisolone, a pred omnicotyl prednisolone, bisolone, any of those is okay. So you could use up to 24, 32 milligrams of a methyl pred, um, something like that every day for five days. Same principles, keep in mind when you're using steroids, prefer to give the dose in the morning so it doesn't disturb the sleep cycle of the patient. Give it along with something that will help to alleviate any acidity caused by the steroids. So you can use the steroids as well. 
Thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, so elaborately answering that. We have a request from Dr. Newstar. I think many of us would want that if you could give us links to some videos on respiratory techniques to cope or to teach uh, the caregivers at home as well. Sure, sure. Yeah, I can. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll look for techniques for, uh, and I'll be sharing this as well with you. So the postural drainage piece also. And uh, somebody asked for acapella device effectively. Acapella is very useful specifically for patients with bronchiectasis. So we have patients who have significant bronchiectasis. For them, I definitely use the acapella regularly because mobilizing secretions does help to reduce the frequency of recurrent infectious exacerbations. Okay, so uh, yes, the acapella, again, to be done, uh, you teach them how to do a nebulization followed by acapella, followed by an assisted cuff cuff. That helps to clear the secretions. And we have one more question. What is the precise value of tranexa in hemoptysis? How does it act? You know, it's a, I can't say it's an extremely effective thing, especially when it comes to a matter of uh, when it's because of a bleeding vascular issue in a tumor or a pulmonary tuberculosis situation. However, if it's a slow ooze in an infectious bronchiectasis kind of a thing, it definitely decreases the amount of bleeding. It reduces it. Um, and, uh, you know, it allows you to at least get started on the antibiotics so that the healing takes place and the, then the bleeding doesn't occur any further. If you're, if you're having severe hemoptysis, um, at that time, that's not going to be useful. Mild to moderate, yes, it's going to be useful. Thank you so much, ma'am. So there's one more follow-up question on Tranexa in hemoptysis. No, we, we don't have, have randomized control trials at all. So all of these, this is again, so you know, there's some of these things that we use. You don't have so much, you don't have high-grade evidence of good RCTs. So then it comes to what is consensus opinions of professional bodies and things like that. So that's where it comes from. Um, and I can't say that there's good quality RCT evidence to say tranexamic, is, uh, tranexamic acid is useful. Thank you so much, ma'am. So I think uh, that brings an end to our discussions. Uh, we have crossed 6.30 as well. Ma'am, if uh, you have any closing remarks for everyone. No, closing remarks are all the very best to all of you as you're on your journey to incorporating palliative care principles into your practice. I hope some of you will continue on to specialize in it. And uh, you can always reach out to me if you have uh, questions with challenging patients. Uh, I'm happy to help at any time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for taking time out, taking such an elaborate session, answering all our questions, all the small ones, big ones, all the basic ones, as well as the complex ones. Uh, thank you for bringing you the again, questions. Yeah. I love seeing the interest that everyone has. It's a great, great cohort. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rezine, for joining us towards the end of the day and uh, taking us through the respiratory symptoms. Actually, I believe uh, from the words of one of the participants, it was a realization that uh, the respiratory symptoms in itself is a very vast field which is uh, under-recognized and uh, so... With that note, uh, this is Sri Priya along with Dr. Rajini Surinder Bhatt and Dr. Deepak Sudhakaran signing off from the Tips Echo Hub. See you in the next session on wound management. Till then, everyone, stay safe, be happy. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, ma'am. Bye-bye.